Um, I'd love to immediately go to the multilateral component. Is that okay with you, Your Excellency? Or? I, I appreciate very much that, and also because the ambassador of Canada speaks much better English than myself, so <laughs> questions may be, may be be difficult for me to answer. Excellent. So then uh, if the panelists would agree, I would suggest maybe if you could join uh, the, the ambassador. You can, you can stay there if you'd like. Uh, the panelists uh, and also the chairman, uh, Mr. Yasser Yakesh, will join you as well. I will say maybe just two words of uh, introduction about two speakers who you have not yet had the chance to get to know as the panelists make their way to the panel. Uh, first of all, you have had a chance to get to know uh, His Excellency the Honorable Mr. Yasser Yakesh, uh, former Foreign Minister of Turkey. Uh, I think, again, a man who needs no introduction. So I will skip over the introduction since we, we had that yesterday. Uh, secondly, you've had the chance to get to know his his Excellency Ambassador John Holmes, Ambassador of Canada to Turkey. Very happy that he can join the panel discussion as well. Uh, thirdly, we've had the chance just now to get some wonderful words of inspiration from the Ambassador of Chile, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Jorge Aranquiba Reyes. Two people you have not yet had the chance to get to know, I'd like to briefly introduce. Uh, we'll do opposite uh, gentleman order. Normally we begin ladies first, but I'll actually end with a lady uh, for a reason. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Erik N. Mathiesen, uh, Deputy Head of Mission from the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Ankara. So maybe you could give a brief welcome also for Mr. Erik Mathiesen. Very happy to have you join us. Thank you. Uh, no, I wanted to save the, the lady for the last, just because I'm also really, in particular, very grateful that she could join us today. Uh, in many ways, she's, I think, a pioneer in terms of also a young Turkish young leader. Uh, we were discussing earlier today also really the potential uh, of the young leaders in Turkey. So I think in many ways, she's a, a wonderful example of that. Uh, Ms. Özlem uh, Pitanologu, uh, Turkona. She's currently a Turkish columnist and politician of the Justice and Development Party, uh, initially graduated from Gazi University's Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences in the Department of Public Administration. She then completed her studies uh, with a Master of International Relations from the University of Middlesex in London. Mm -hmm. Then she was a member of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, mm -hmm. TBMM, and between 2007 and 2011 was the member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. She's currently, as I said, working as a columnist in Turkey and as a politician in the Justice and Development Party. So if we could also give a special introduction for Ms. Oslem Pitanologu Turkone. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over to our chairman, uh, His Excellency Mr. Yasser Yakesh. Thank you very much. I will not make introductory remarks because uh, we are running out of time. And uh, I will give the floor directly to Islam uh, Piltanoğlu. You may have thought that she came here to participate in a beauty contest, but she did not. She came only to participate in the panel. You have the floor. But make it as short as possible. The two ambassadors have already made their presentation and perhaps they may say a few words, a, a thought provocative, pro provoking remarks. And we may listen to our uh, a colleague from the Norwegian embassy uh, so that we move immediately to the question and answer uh, period so that uh, at that time it, is, it becomes more lively. So I kindly request you to make, to make it as brief as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to do my best uh, to keep it brief and short. Uh, as you already know that every nation or state, is it an hour? Yeah. Okay. Uh, every nation or society, uh, one or another, um, even for a limited time or period, uh, face some internal challenges to building democracy. As a former parliamentarian, I would like to today emphasize on my own country's, Turkey's experience on its uh, path to democratization. Uh, in, an, in our endeavor to achieve democracy and peace, but peace at home and abroad, but not in narrow sense, not in terms of achieve, uh, not in terms of achieve uh, just order peace, but I will mainly talk about the role of the army and Kemal's judiciary, uh, especially in, in Turkey, in blocking democratization in the country. Before going to details about the Turkish historical journey uh, towards peace and democratization, uh, first I would like to emphasize that I will mainly focus on peace uh, at home aspect today, rather than uh, peace at abroad. And I would like to also emphasize on uh, the understanding of Johan 
Galtung's famous distinctions about peace. Uh, negative peace or positive peace? And when we say negative peace, we always actually focus on not having any kind of uh, violent, uh, the absence of violent. But it, when it comes to positive peace, it means that not only having a violent or conflict, but also including coherence, collaboration, cooperation, existing different uh, s groups or states. So in this sense, peace in a deeper sense involves justice and uh, democracy. And in this presentation, I'll actually try to focus uh, interchangeably, I use democracy and peace in a positive way. As already known, uh, Turkish military played a key role in the nation building process, hence the modernization era also stimulated by the army. And it can be argued that having a role like this, the military elites from the very beginning of the Republican era till the, to the last few years had not been experiencing any appreciable uh, difficulties in placing themselves in the political life. Unlike its counterparts in Western societies, Turkish army has considerable uh, amount of political and institutional autonomy, which ultimately leads to emphasize its role in guaranteeing, guarding the state from internal enemies and sustaining the security of the country and order in the society. One can uh, trace this autonomy and power uh, in the history, find its roots in the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman heritage. Uh, with the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, the army placed itself in daily politics and uh, with administrative motives. There's a consensus on the political and institutional autonomy of the army, and that autonomy paves the way for the democracy to become more fragile. We also need to take into consideration that the founder fathers of the Turkish Republic were the last pushers of the Ottoman Empire. So they inherited some culture or some understanding from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it is more likely to say that Ottoman Empire created pre-modern uh, distinctive, pre-modern form of religious and ethnic accommodation and tolerance and, uh, to and toleration. On the other hand, founder fathers of the, of the Republic had witnessed this dissolution uh, of empire and mainly they have believed they had believed that the reason of this dissolution uh, of empire uh, and derives from the that understanding of coexistence so in other saying instead of recognizing minorities or diversity or pluralistic policies the turkish state has tried to create a monolithic uh, society in its own image. The statist aspect of Kemalist ideology had led to the state's attempt to monopolize various spheres, including the economy, education, culture, language, and religion, and restrictive civil society and thus democracy. Kemalist leaders saw the army forces, armed forces, as the main pillar actually to uh, to the new regime and instrumentalized the army as the, for the combating reactionary forces during the one party rule till the late, late 1940s. So this means that always negative peace, order in monolithic society is preferred and positive peace and thus human rights freedom and democratization has often been sacrificed for the sake of so-called peace and security in the country. With the change uh, of the political rule in 1950s, the new era uh, for civil uh, military relations had started. But when it comes to on the 27th May of 1960, uh, army, for army to carry out the coup was the argument that Mender's government has lost his uh, democracy legitimacy. The army introduced a new constitution in 1961, which introducing a very wide range of civil rights and social rights, but however, with fear of probable 
domination of the majority, uh, some institutions were built among which were the Constitutional Court and National Security Council. The Council is a mechanism uh, to help the military exercise political authority underneath civilian rule. And as the embodiment of the bureaucracy's primacy over the popularly elected parliament, the, this Council's security policies in the following years, starting with 1970s and especially during the 1980s and 1990s, has constituted one of the main internal challenges to building positive peace and democracy in Turkish society, since they deeply harm the necessary balance between security and freedoms in the country. Freedom has always been the one which is sacrificed. The army has always used the political disputes and conflicts between various social groups in a country as an opportunity to intervene the political life, to an end civilian rule, to increase its power and to curb human rights and freedoms. This fact made the military as the main stumbling block in Turkey's path to the democratization. On the 12th March 1971, we actually faced a similar intervention and the constitution of 1961 minimized and the National Security Council was extending to making recommendations to the government. So Turkish politics in 1970s was characterized by fragmentation and polarization and lack of by the decisive authority on the part of the government. Economic breakdown, civil violence and polarization, all these factors actually prepared a basis for the 1980 military intervention. Once again, the army used the political conflicts and polarizations in the political and social life as an excuse to intervene in normal politics, to increase its power by using the argument that army is the only true body to sustain so-called peace in the country. However, what they provided was basically negative peace, simply order, but not real coherence, collaboration, harmony and pluralism, social understanding, freedoms and democracy. So all these were missing within the Turkey society until recently was dominated the society was basically militarism, pressure human rights violation and democratic deficit. The 1980 military coup made the state apparatus become militarized in all dimensions, besides making the army a lawmaker uh, authority. The university is put under tight centralized control through the higher education authority. And also national security council status was enhanced, and its recommendation would be given uh, to priority consideration by the council of ministers. The 1982 constitutions, which reflects uh, the crucial patterns of that period, limited the basic rights and liberties, limited the scope of civilian judiciary branch, judiciary branch, besides threatening the political autonomy of the military. It was not designed to protect its citizens' rights and citizens uh, and freedoms. Instead, it is designed actually to protect the ide ideological state uh, against its citizens. As an exa as example, a constitutional court's decision uh, to disband Kurdish nationalists and Islamist uh, political parties. The path going through the 28th February also uh, needed to, need to be evaluated. And the threatening of the Islamic factors, actors in po both political and economic spares, uh, which started as a result of the Özal's policies, led to the variation of Islamic uh, identities in terms. Besides economic identities in the 1990s, uh, witnessed the emergence of ethnic and religious identities. In the result of that, in 1995, uh, at the general elections, welfare party, uh, as the winner party, created a very considerable amount of tension in many civilians and uh, in military circles. Uh, these people claimed that the welfare party did not actually believe in democracy and secularism as the whole, sole characteristics of the regime. So the military intervention actually didn't throw away the democratic mechanisms, but whereas making its function under military tutelage, to do that, military elites use briefings, conferences, 
civil society organizations, campaigns, media and judges support, and uh, regularly organized public declarations which were addressing to the threats of political is Islam and Kurdish nationalism against the survival of the state. So although the main legacy of 1980 coup in today's Turkey is the current constitution, the dom domestic dynamics of Turkish politics have obviously been influenced by several uh, international factors especially Turkish application to the European Union. A significant step about the democratization of civil military relations was taken in the late 90s. Military judges uh, were removed from the state security courts, and especially after October 2001, uh, so many amendments made to change the structure of the National Security Council. And when it comes to the September 2010, the Turkish electorate voted by a landslide to approve a package of the amendments, uh, 24 amendment of the constitutions. And one of these amendments is to make it more difficult for the constitutional court to dis dissolve uh, political parties. Uh, since its foundation in 1963, the constitutional court uh, has closed 25 political parties uh, while the rest of the long-standing st democracies and Western societies at, uh, in Europe had only closed four parties. So in this sense, constitutional court especially and the judiciary under the influence of Kemalistic ideology can be considered as one of the main historical internal challenges uh, blocking the democratization process of Turkey. Conclusion, I can say that the developments and these amendments in the judiciary and military reveal that uh, Kemalist ideology is no longer preeminent in Turkey. Also, although it, it still has some powerful followers, this means that two main actually internal challenges towards democracy in the Turkish context have been eradicated. I mean, the anti-democratic nature of these institutions have to large extent erased. These developments certainly made us closer to democracy and true positive peace at home. But uh, are we there yet? Uh, has the struggle ended? Uh, certainly not. And this is a gradual process. Uh, yes, we've been taking a vital uh, steps, but there is still a lot to do. Uh, as not all challenges to uh, democracy are erased and as well as new internal challenges can always uh, emerge. And from now on, so many political parties in Turkey, whenever there is a need for the reforms, they use an excuse and refer to the Turkish army as an obstacle uh, on the way to these reforms. But after these amendments, even the constitution is still based on the uh, aftermath of the uh, 1980s coup. But these days, no, no government, no longer government can actually use this as an excuse. And every responsibility is, I suppose, are, is under the shoulders of, uh, on the shoulders of uh, the government uh, because the the path to the democratization, uh, so many uh, obstacles like uh, institutional ob obstacles like the Constitutional Court or uh, the National Security Council now changed its form. Uh, so I believe that now the task of the governments are much more difficult than before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Biltanoğlu. It was very thought-provoking provo uh, statement, and I hope that you will be bombarded by questions. <laughs> and uh, we are now 15 minutes to the lunch time. Oh. Mr. Ambassador, uh, would you like to add something to very uh, inspiring speech that you made this morning? Uh, and we benefited a lot from your wisdom. But if, if you want to provoke thoughts, you may do so, so that we continue. 
Um, I'll be very brief because I did have an opportunity to speak and I would like uh, to engage in a dialogue with our panelists and uh, um, uh, with you, the, the audience. But uh, I wanted to um, talk about uh, three very quick issues which our panelists uh, have, um, have raised, which I think are fundamental to moving forward if we all agree that our goal is to establish a just, fair, peaceful world based on good governance, rule of law, human rights, etc. Um, Ambassador of Chile highlighted at the end of his statement something that is uh, fundamentally important. Uh, I talked a little bit about it this morning, the root causes of violence and uh, fragility in states. And, and he um, highlighted something which we, we tend to think of root causes of an economic nature as happening in uh, very poor states. But he highlighted in middle-income countries like, like Chile, and it's very much an issue in the EU, in Canada, and US, uh, the growing problem of income disparity and how you deal with that issue. And even in rich countries, you are seeing uh, pockets of poverty and uh, a high unemployment where people are no longer able to get jobs. So uh, I welcome your discussion on that uh, very important point. He also, as a part of his personal anecdotes, um, uh, talked about something which I touched on this morning but very quickly, and that is the importance of dialogue, the importance of, if you will, cultural diplomacy, where he was able to overcome animosity, suspicion, through personal dialogue with his quote-unquote enemies. So I, I think that was a very uh, good example, very real example, of how dialogue can overcome misunderstandings. And finally, uh, a very good overview. I'm taking notes on what she said um, on, on recent Turkish history. Um, and underlying your discussion was the role of military in modern societies. And what is that role? How do you achieve that role? And especially countries that come from a different background. Uh, I saw it certainly in Indonesia, which has become uh, one of the world's leading democracies, but still grappling with the issue of the role of the military in society. So three, I think, very useful points of discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Now I turn to His Excellency, the Ambassador of Chile. He uh, also let us benefit from his wisdom and experience. And I am one year senior in this world than Your Excellency. I was born in 38. <laughs> Uh, but uh, your remarks regarding the role of the army in Chile uh, has a lot of uh, parallel with the role of army in Turkey, as uh, uh, Mrs. Piltanoğlu mentioned. Uh, now that uh, we know the general framework of the evo evolution in Chile, if you would like to say a few words to, to uh, provoke thoughts again, uh, I leave the microphone to you so that uh, we can continue and you prepare the ground for uh, provocative questions also. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, I thought I have already jumped into the swimming pool, so uh, I, I put a, a topic that for us in Chile is very, very interesting and we discuss a lot about that. But dealing with your question about the role of the armed forces, I may say that the, if you go to the historical process in my country from the, the time we get our independence, much more than 200 years ago, dealing with uh, Turkish uh, history, it's nothing, but 200 years of independence has allowed us to, to be where we are now. I may say that during all those periods, uh, except for the uh, 40 initial years of independence, the armed forces has not played any political role. Uh, so for us, it was quite a surprise uh, to have to intervene in a dramatical moment in our history. That means the 11th of September. And uh, when and doing that, uh, they also at that time put some program. They decide to go to make a new constitution to government until that time and to make uh, uh, to, to put an election in between if they can continue governing the country or they leave the power. So uh, and then they accomplish that and they leave when the people says that's enough. And as I told you, it was a necessity because uh, the world was uh, closed 
and since then it opens and our trade is uh, very successful. So I may say that uh, I am not able to compare the situation in Turkey with the one in Chile, where our armed forces, they act uh, in a specific moment, in a specific situation, and at the end, in a very successful way, dealing with the economic factors. Of course, there are some violations to uh, human rights that they are being treated now in the, in the justice. Mm -hmm. So that's what I may say till now. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Now I turn to Mr. Matheson, who is the uh, second in command in the Norwegian embassy. The people second in command in an embassy is the main pillar of the embassy. I have done this 30 years ago, uh, perhaps before uh, Mr. Matheson was born. And uh, I know what a difficult task is and how influential it is on what the em embassy is doing. Uh, since uh, Mr. Messon did not address to the audience beforehand, perhaps he is allowed to use more time, but uh, I will appreciate if he could be as concise as possible so that we leave more room uh, to the question and answer period. You have the floor, Mr. Messon. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Yakesh. Uh, it is indeed interesting to be second in command of two political diplomats in an embassy, particularly when the ambassador is away and uh, unable to, to meet with all of you today. But uh, I'm very happy that the Norwegian embassy was invited. So a big thank you to, to ICD and uh, the ARI movement uh, for, for organizing this conference. Um, the topic of this session gave me a chance to revisit my school books as a political scientist. And, um, uh, I found, uh, again, that there are many different uh, definitions of democracy, but uh, I, I, I easily remember two uh, that, uh, that I like, maybe because of their simplicities, and says I'm a diplomat and not a, a scholar. Um, the first one is a very minimalist one, and it defines democracy as a system uh, where parties lose elections. I've always liked that. It's short and snappy and, and easy to remember, and, and, it, and it gives a couple of pointers. Uh, another one calls democracy uh, and elections the institutional wager, the institutionalized bet, if you like. I think you can sum that up as, as democracy being a system where every vote and voice carry the, carry the same weight. Now, the reason I mention these two is that both of them say something about the importance of institutions, and both of them also indicate that building a democracy or consolidating a democracy is a process that takes time. Um, the ambassadors have focused on uh, or mentioned uh, the importance of dialogue, and that is the, the main, uh, my main uh, area of focus also for, for uh, my short presentation. And I will keep it short. Um, there's a second element in the institutional nature approach that the first one, the very short one, doesn't have. Uh, and I think to understand democracy as an institutional bet, uh, participants, both parties and voters, are much, more, much less likely to engage in a bet if they're not prepared to accept the outcome. Uh, and the outcome in casting your vote uh, is that you risk ending up at the side of the minority. So you need some sort of trust in minority rights being uh, taken care of and that, uh, and you need to respect for your political opponent's voice carrying as much weight as, as your own. And I believe that this calls from, for dialogue uh, and for engagement. Not only the members of your own party or your own social group, but you actually then need to engage those that profoundly disagree with you. Uh, and I'll, I'll return to this in a, in a minute. Uh, we live in a time that is interesting and, and, and challenging, particularly in, uh, in many of the neighboring countries of, of Turkey. Um, there are revolutions happening and they're happening bottom up. They are also very different from country to country. And the challenges absolutely need to be dealt with internally. I mean, transition 
processes uh, transition to democracy is an internal process. Yet I would also like to, to underscore that the international community has both a responsibility and an interest in engaging positively with the processes in this country. Traditional diplomacy between states matter also in, in, in this uh, context. Perhaps the most important thing that, that we have to address as, as diplomats and, and more importantly for our politicians is to avoid setting double standards. Um, and we also have a toolbox where there are both carrots and, and also sticks uh, and, they, and they should be used wisely. Uh, my own minister, Jonas Gaustöre, he, uh, he makes an effort to be a proponent of dialogue and, and when he travels he wants to meet as many sides and, and groups as possible in, in the countries he visits. Uh, sometimes we also try to bring groups together and meet them all at the same time. Uh, and I wanted to share two quotes from one such dinner which took place very, uh, relatively recently in in our country in the region, uh, where we had guests that were moderate and not so moderate and uh, belonging to majority and uh, the majority and, and also to, to several minorities. Uh, the first quote came from one of the dinner guests and he said, um, you know, we only sit around the same table when we have visitors from abroad. The second quote it was a response to a question from my sometimes very blunt boss. Uh, when, 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 a, when a guest was asked if he respects his political opponent sitting across him uh, at the table. It was a long pause. And then he, I don't know if it was reluctantly or not, but answered, not really. Now, there are no shortages of reasons why different groups in transitional democracies or you could even say established ones uh, don't trust each other or even respect each other. Uh, but my point is that this does represent an internal threat to democracy. Um, in Norway we also find that there is a shortage of dialogue in traditional diplomacy between states, but this mistake should not be repeated by actors in transitional democracies. Now, as was also mentioned, transition to democracy is a process where several and very difficult challenges coincide. You have economies that often need to be restructured. You have to meet expectations from a uh, population with, with a hope for, for something new, something better. And these hopes keep growing, but the more successful you are in consolidating your democracy, the, 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 the better equipped you are to meet them, as, as the ambassador of Chile has, has pointed to. Um, and you also need to establish institutions at the same time. Uh, and and this, the overlap of, of different processes can indeed be a, a source of instability. That's why it's vital to, to try to make the pie bigger rather than smaller, and, and as much as possible try to avoid zero-sum game thinking. Uh, and again, without respect and, and dialogue, uh, this becomes much more difficult. So uh, three short points on concluding why I don't think uh, talking about talking is, is naive, because it is usually or quite often uh, seen as such. Um, first of all, there are many, very many different ways of talking to each other. A dialogue can happen in very many forms uh, on different levels. You don't, it, a dialogue doesn't have to start with the leaders of political parties sitting in a room and having to go and face the press immediately after. Uh, and the key is, I think, in my reading, to engage groups in a process and then build on that. Uh, a Norwegian experience when it comes to dialogue uh, as a main component in our diplomacy is also that we see that engagement does foster responsibility uh, among the actors. Second uh, is that it's possible to leave the table. Uh, you can walk away from the talk. Uh, and third and finally, uh, by talking you accept that your political opponents have a right uh, to, to advocate their views. This is something that you will have to face sooner or later. It's a prerequisite for a consolidated democracy uh, and, uh, and, and it's a part of building a political culture uh, that should also include civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
we have reached the lunch time, but we, we, I don't like to let the distinguished panelists leave us before answering uh, a lot of questions because we cannot find that uh, much uh, distinguished panelists easily, all of them together uh, at present. So I now ask for the floor to ask questions. Professor, when you stand up, you, they will bring it to you. Thank you very much uh, to all panelists. I'm Alpe Zardan from uh, Center for Peace and Reconciliation Studies at Coventry University. Um, your interventions uh, about transition, transitioning to democracy uh, seemed to me that what it was mainly um, in lines of institutional level. But I'd like to bring another dimension to that, and that's this sort of transition at the social level. Demilitarization of minds, demilitarization of society. And I think that's a really important issue because you can deal with the institutions, but how are you going to deal with the society? And uh, the reason I'm bringing this point is when you look at the, the trial of the 1980 coup, I also remember people who welcomed 1980 coup. I remember people who filled the public squares, you know, cheering for the leaders of the 1980 coup. So there is an element of society supporting, you know, that kind of military power and the military presence. So my question is, what does the panel think that we should do for the demilitarization of society and demilitarization of minds? Thank you. Thank you very much. In Turkey, uh, the families do not give away their daughters to, for people who did not serve in the army. So the army is an institution which makes people the real men. So, but I'm sure that uh, our panelists will respond to your question in a very important manner. Yes, please. Thank you. It's a very good, actually, comment and a uh, question. I suppose it's so. Yeah. Uh, of course, I cannot remember people cheering at the streets. I was very young at that time, <laughs> but uh, I know that from the books and from uh, uh, from old people, they. Uh, transmitted their experience to me uh, but I believe that maybe after having a very uh, intensive violence people uh, might just welcome uh, not having any kind of violent and, and at least living in a negative peace context. So that's why in my presentation I try to focus on uh, how actually military use a negative peace to uh, take all the control of the country. Uh, and what the governments needs to do, need to do is to enhance and improve and support the, uh, to establish the positive uh, peace, uh, to, to have collaboration, uh, to have cooperation, to give at least a little bit uh, breath for the uh, religious groups, minorities, or uh, some discriminated uh, groups. Uh, and well, what you said about the mind the, uh, of the militarized, militarized minds, that's definitely uh, exactly right. And I can give you one of the example uh, about the survey which actually done maybe three or, or four years ago, TESEV, uh, about, uh, for the judge, and uh, prosecutors and the question uh, to the judge and the prosecutors were very important and distinctive and uh, that is uh, if you had any kind of situation uh, between protecting the uh, pro protect the states or to protect the rights of the citizens and the freedoms of citizens what would you choose and it's really interesting that the Majority of the judges and prosecutors, I can understand prosecutors because their mind is definitely, of course, partial to protect the state, but I cannot understand what judges answered. I mean, and, and the majority of the judges said they uh, prefer to protect state rather than individuals' right. So that's a clear indication of that uh, militarization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Yes. 
you know, I, I am convinced that there are different countries and different societies dealing with uh, your question. I, I may say that in Chile, uh, our society is already militarized. You put a, a band to play music and people start uh, marching, you know, from, from the old times. Uh, we have a very strong, uh, powerful people and they are very proud of that. I think that they are very similar to Turkish people in that sense. Uh, we have had some international problems and wars and we have been the wars and that means uh, lots of uh, uh, things that people uh, really recognize from our society. So when the military coup came, uh, lots of people went to the streets and were shouting and very happy to, to, to live in this. After that we have, as, as I told you, a very strong society, we have a strong fight between the military and the opposite uh, part in the, in the country and lots of people died in this fight. But what I may say is that after this experience, now the recent polls we are doing, asking the people what they feel, how they uh, qualify different institutions in my country, and you can find this in, in the media. Uh, military are in the top of the list. So again, I am going to tell you that after being that uh, such a strong experience that we do have, the military are again on the top, but they are doing their job. They, they, and I think this is one of the reasons why they have gained again this uh, special position. Thank you. Thank you very much. How does it work? Thank you. It went okay. Uh, no problem. I will, I will speak loudly. Uh, it's not. No. It's it Now it works, yeah. Yes, uh, of course, demilitarization is, is a culture. It is not changing institutions or changing le legislation. You could change legislation overnight. But culture takes longer time to evolve. It, you cannot change culture, you can let the culture evolve. So by preparing the ground, by institution making or, or passing laws, you may uh, prepare the ground for the evolution of this culture in that direction. I think this must be very important. So uh, now, uh, positive discrimination in favor of ladies. Um, excuse me, I've been just waiting since the um, High Excellency of Chile um, for, I have comments, I have questions as well, and food for thoughts as well. I'm about to say I'm working as a political psychologist in Lebanon for the for UNDP, at the, for the national um, process on dialogue. So there is a national dialogue process going on. Um, for the High Excellency of um, her, um, Holmes and also um, Matthias, and thank you very much for insightful view. According to the funding structures, we can see that within your foreign policy, which sort of guideline um, you fund and support. And um, I think when it comes to culture of um, demilitarization and the evolution of culture, of course it's taking a long time, but living in countries post-conflict countries and also countries where who, who can be who can be named and labeled as post, as conflict countries without having a conflict which is violent so having a psychology of polarization and fragmentation today in Turkey from the individual intra individual and societal level is for me a conflict country and um, so I think while putting and excuse me please if I'm wrong um, in front of this panel but isn't that diplomacy to put exactly the right guidelines to the agenda and say we proclaim and invite people for the na for a national dialogue process this is something we do in lebanon for example and so i think there are different ways in different aspects who can be tackled so it's just a question of political will and um um to you as well thank you very much um, um uh, mrs pilantolo for your insightful view i think negative peace you've been talking about negative peace as far as I know, there is peace. If, if peace is existent, there's no need to talk about it. And if there's an absence of peace, please correct me if I'm wrong, then there's nothing like negative. It's, it's, non, it's nothing, right? So uh, I do, um, so thank you very much for your whole um, journey through the history. But coming to Chile, 
this is a comment I've been waiting so long and I have to urge to tell. According to my childhood, I've been reading a lot of literature of La Muerte, La Doncella, uh, with, the, uh, with the fall of the Salvador Algenda regime. And I think even today, I mean, we can see that Nelson Mandela was, he was a president and he was able to, who um, commands a, a process on truth and reconciliation in South Africa. Kofi Annan did the same in Kenya. So why we don't have that in Chile? I would like to have, have your inside view on that. So if, you're, if there's not a room and a common space where people are able to gather and mourn, there's no way to forgive for them. And I think this is something that um, it's not the peacekeeping, it's the peace building. And this is generally the true and honest way of inviting to a dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, it, was, uh, it is addressed to all of them. Perhaps uh, the distinguished panelists may uh, wish to comment. But uh, regarding the negative piece, of course, what is meant, most probably Mrs. Piltano will also, uh, may also wish to comment on it. It is an oppressed peace. There is peace. Nobody is demonstrating around. Nobody is killing each other. But it is as a result of oppression that the authorities put on the society. That is the negative piece. Most probably this is what she meant, but uh, I do not want to uh, substitute myself uh, in her place. Uh, would you like to comment, any of you, uh, on the, this charming lady's uh, uh, very uh, thought-provoking uh, comments as well? Uh, it's a very thought-provoking comment, but I would like to once again actually underline uh, what John uh, Galchung's definition, uh, distinctive defi definition about peace, and, and uh, that is his... Uh, definition and division of negative and positive peace, which I really uh, like to follow uh, when I'm thinking about my country's uh, historical background uh, when it comes to on the path to democratization. Uh, not having violence doesn't mean that you, you're actually feeling the full peace uh, in your society. Sometimes pressures can be very... Uh, 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 could be applied in a very indirect ways. Uh, you cannot see it tangibly and everywhere, but you can feel it some, somehow. So I believe that during the uh, after and during the military coup and afterwards, like after the post uh, postmodern uh, interventions, we feel that there isn't any kind of direct uh, interventions to the democratic mechanisms. Uh, no. Uh, military soldiers or any any actors directly involving in the uh, mechanisms and ruling uh, like judiciary or executive bodies or any kind of legal bodies uh, but you can feel that they use some media uh, structures some organizations some kind of conferences deep state and again. deep state again is just somehow surfacing by using different tools rather than directly involving like uh, 1960s uh, coup or 1980s coup. We can divide actually, um, I mean, if you look back to the Turkish uh, coup history, we can mainly say that we have two different uh, kind of military interventions. One is a kind of guarding uh, regime coups like 1960s and 1980s, directly uh, try to change the system, directly uh, intervene, uh, and uh, rule for a couple of years, for certain years, and also to try to build the new system, to, uh, to introduce new constitution, and uh, legalize it, and introduce new uh, institutions to protect the regime. So this is uh, the one. And the other one is kind of veto regime, rather than directly intervening. Uh, Postmodern, uh, coup in 28 February is a very crucial example to that. I mean, you just veto it. You have some path, a roadmap for the country, and if there is any kind of uh, government I, or I political wish. actors trying to be out of the track of this line, then you veto it somehow, uh, intervene indirectly, and put these 
all uh, actors, political actors, uh, back to the track again. So it's a veto a regime. So when I say that it's a negative piece and positive means uh, piece, I try to actually emphasize not having violence is not enough. It's the society needs much more things uh, to actually uh, feel uh, the peace. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, do you want to make comments? Yes, I think I may. I, I was mentioned twice or three times in your presentation, but uh, I, I, I don't think if I understand well what you ask. Uh, but anyway, I will try to, to, to give an answer. Uh, I, 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 I think or I feel that in your question, it was something dealing with uh, that we have not uh, achieved yet. Okay. That, that we have not achieved yet is inside the country, that, that we need some, some kind of uh, recognition or something like this. So what, I mean, there is... No, no, I, I think it's okay. Do you have the uh, La Comisión de Verdad y Reconciliación? And but you still have a lot of desparecidos. So what I'm asking is, there's also many NGOs fighting for, um, fighting um, very similar to Turkey, um, to find uh, the disappeared ones of their family members. So I'm saying, how is it there anyway? I mean, I can't see it, but you're the insider, so um, I'm directing it to you. Whether there's any chance within a time frame of 10, 15 years, it's going to take that Chile's government. Do you see any? Because we've been talking about the psychology of change. Peace is, peace is all about that, actually. It's an attitudinal change. So is there any hint or any hope for going into that direction um, that people may open it up? Because if you open it up, it's going to cause a lot of pain at, at the same time as well. Yeah, got my point? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, my, my personal experience, again, uh, when I was commander in chief of the Navy, after the ready uh, information that the investigation they have done, that we have two of them, ready is one and Valage is another one, we have uh, investigated the number of people that has died, the number of people that was detention, and, and at the same time, people that has disappeared. When I was commander in chief, we, we, we worked with the government at that time trying to build up the, the truth and finding where those disappeared people were, if it was possible to get this information. Believe me that we try to do our best. Uh, and I put a special commission inside the Navy to try to request from the people that we know that they were in these areas at that time. And uh, we have a very poor answer. So it's something of personal interest, you know, and fear maybe of the consequences of uh, if they are going to uh, receive, if they, uh, the, the society knows that he was part of some missing action. Uh, and we get very, very few information that we gave it to the government. I am speaking about the Navy. In the Army it was less than this yet. Uh, and uh, this was the last effort we have been doing in that. When we were doing that, when we were asking people, approaching people that may have known something about that, uh, there were some uh, politicians that says, uh, because we have an arrangement, we says, if I get the information where the people is, I am going to give the information to the government, and they are going to give satisfaction to their families. That was the main objective. When we had, were doing that, some politicians at that time, I was not a politician at that time, some ones of them says, no, it's not possible. If, if you know something, you must tell who is the guy, and then the information was cut off. We don't get it anymore because sanctions were over the head of those that were giving the information. This is a practical. Uh, practical uh, answer that I am giving you. We made a specific and very strong effort, but we don't get what we need because people fear that they can be uh, punished for uh, what he has done. 
And uh, what is important is uh, we know that we have uh, some people that is hurt with this experience, and, and this hurt is very strong one. Uh, it's never going to finish in, in their life experience. But uh, at least now we are trying to improve in our society uh, that the, the justice works, uh, makes its work. The, the imperial of law, it's what is running. People that uh, have something to respond in front of justice, they have been facing the justice. Some ones, uh, as I told you, in the jail. The other ones are uh, in the process. The admin forces are back in their own jobs. And uh, as I told you, the last polls, they put the other forces that has this in their souls, uh, in the top of the list of the preference. I may tell my experience. We try to do, we try to get information about the disappeared people. This is the most important and the most dangerous wound that we have in our society, actually. Thank you very much. Bless Pascal used to say, the heart has its reasons that the reason does not recognize. In politics also, Politics has its reasons that the reason does not recognize. This is what surfaces in the information of both the intervention of both of you. You have the floor now. I just wanted to briefly uh, thank you all. It's been a uh, very interesting clarification. Um, my name is Elijah Bush. I'm a PhD student. And uh, I wanted to ask a question related to the actual title of the, the panel. Um, I am not a diplomat, I'm, uh, and so I, f I feel like I can ask maybe an ignorant question or maybe a little bit provocative, but internal challenges to building democracy. Um, in Turkey, I think there's some very specific ones that um, when we talk about negative peace, uh, it's not usually sustainable. And I wonder if, if you might uh, take off your badges as diplomats and comment more candidly on um, the prospects for um, things like the, the uh, independent Kurdistan movement. and. Um, a lot of minority groups like the uh, Armenians and the persistent uh, denial of genocide and some of these other topics that I think are significant internal challenges to building a real democracy. And uh, again, I know there are delicate, even in the Chilean context, I'm sure there are some, um, some of the indigenous groups and some of the history there that's, that's also painful, but um, I think is an important part of any real reconciliation process and, and having, uh, I guess, more than just an artificial imposed or monolithic Turkish identity, but also allowing for multiple identities of people who maybe first and foremost identify as Alevi or Kurdish or Armenian or whatever it may be. So if you could comment on that. Thank please. you very much. We believe that we have grown mature enough in Turkey not to be, uh, uh, to have a negative reaction when the provocative questions are asked. Sometimes I encourage the audience to ask provocative questions. So I'm sure that this question is also very provocative and uh, it is good that you ask this question. The provocative, the answers to the provocative questions mm -hmm. is recorded better and deeper in your mind in the memory. So now I ask the panelists to comment on it if they wish. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a very good comment and question actually. And I believe that Turkey is uh, enough m mature to uh, face uh, these minority groups and uh, different ethnic backgrounds, uh, even different religious, uh, even different sects like Alevis. And uh, that's the actually main point that I was trying to put in my presentation that if you look to the historical background of this geography, you'll see that even at the Ottoman Empire period. There are uh, much, uh, multicultural coexistence and uh, people in a pre-modern sense were actually uh, uh, easily can show their identities and, and f feel peace uh, in the society. Uh, but as I said, we should always take into uh, account that uh, the founder fathers of this republic were also the last pashas of Ottoman Empire. So they not inter inherited the influence of the uh, very uh, strong army into the political life, but also they believe that that's the reason the empire dissoluted by the 
uh, mutual uh, multicultural coexistence. So they scared a little bit. They think that if they can ha only establish one monolithic uh, identity, like Turkishness, nation state. or nation state, like uh, French at that period before that uh, did, and follow that path would only also uh, make them safe in, in this uh, land. But uh, uh, society uh, is not a uh, monolithic. We have a very plural uh, society. And recognizing uh, their identities, I believe that uh, makes us to go through to the path of positive peace. And uh, as long as uh, the ideas not actually including violence, I believe that, for, that's my own uh, point, uh, that it should have is it should always welcome to uh, in society, even uh, separate separatists can uh, openly uh, declare or announce uh, when it includes violence, uh, when they apply or implement some kind of violence that is uh, harming uh, the society, the rule of law and the democracy. So we should make a clear distinction uh, for Thank both. You. Thank you. Is it for us, your, your, are we running out? Uh, Mark, shall we now put a uh, deadline for questions? What? Uh, one final question. So, I will now perhaps turn to the Norwegian uh, colleague of ours. No, no, it's fine. Thank you. Uh, perhaps, Your Excellency, when you wish to comment on that question, perhaps after this question, you may also uh, answer both if it is directed to you or the, the, other, span the other panelists as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Carsten Pelletemüller from the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage Research. Um, I want to thank you very much for, for the responses and the, the account for the Turkish history. Uh, and I think, um, I think there's every reason to congratulate Turkey with much of the process of reforms which your country has been through. Um, there is, however, always a risk when you fight a, an enemy of emulating uh, the, what the enemy has done. For instance, uh, uh, Atatürk emulated the mistakes of the West European nation states in building this monolithic identity in defense of a Turkey which was sort of attacked from all sides. Uh, that's easy to understand. Today, the situation is perhaps that um, the present reform government is doing away with a lot of the um, malignities of the, uh, of the Kemalist tradition uh, and building um, a different society. But in that process, where you're also up against what you have several times referred to as the deep state, um, you might also run a risk of emulating some of the mistakes of the previous uh, rulers, the previous ruling elite of the country. Uh, so that's, that's a pitfall. Uh, I believe and hope you're beyond that, but still uh, I would like to hear if you have any reflections about where are you? Are you beyond the point? of return where you are on a safe road towards democracy, full democracy, or are there risks of falling into the same traps as uh, the previous uh, regimes have been in? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I turn to the panelists and to make their final statements, then we close the discussion. And uh, if there are questions on the individual basis, they may ask the panelists during the lunch break. So now I turn to the panelists, whoever would like to take the floor first. Do you mind? OK. Um, it's a very good comment, and a comment that, uh, yeah, well, that, that is a possibility. I mean, we're living in, in society, and always politics uh, have new challenges. And uh, so, uh, and that's a very delicate period that uh, all political actors uh, must be really careful about that. Uh, that's why, as I earlier, uh, said earlier, um, now 
to the path to the full democratization uh, for the governments, there's no way uh, to use any kind of institution or authority or body uh, as an excuse uh, not, not to implement uh, full rights of citizens. Uh, so uh, till now, uh, so many governments or political actors easily refer to the Turkish army and they always say that we want to do some reforms. We, we really respect human rights. We believe uh, diversity in society. Uh, we believe different religion groups live in this country. We believe the minority rights and all other things. We'll, we believe collaboration and coexisting but always refer to the army and they say that they don't let us to do these reforms. They don't let us to do the change, make the change for having a better society. So these excuses by this institutional amendment uh, has actually stopped uh, to the process. And now the governments whoever or whichever be in power now and in the future uh, have full responsibility about the Kurdish issue, about the other minority issues, about any other things. So excuses are diminished and it's finished. There is no longer uh, any excuses, but that's a possibility. Uh, it's a very delicate issue that the governments and, and the political actors who are in, in power should take into consideration about the way they're actually introducing new mechanisms uh, for having full democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I'm going to be uh, giving you a short answer. Uh, in my country, in Chile, actually, we have, uh, I may say, the full democratic system working. We have freedom of speech, writing, religion, uh, free of uh, opportunities for women and, and men. We have no difference on that. And uh, with your specific uh, comment, we have some minorities in the country. I may say maybe two to the main ones. They are, the last are very short, very small ones. One of them is the Rapa Nui. Uh, minority that lives in Easter Island in the center of nowhere, in the center of uh, the Pacific, in a small island. And they have uh, their, own, their own culture, they, and they are improving this culture, and we are trying to support this to be done. Uh, actually, uh, tourism is one of the biggest uh, incomes that the island has, uh, so we are very happy with that. We have just uh, get some special laws for them to, to can administrate their own budget and things like that, that they are very, very, they were looking for that for a long pe period of time. And the other ones that I may, may refer to even uh, in the ethnic minorities is the Mapuches that live in the southern part of the country, in near, near Temuco, near Concepcion, in the southern, green part of the country, not, not in the south-south. Uh, and in this uh, area, we have lots of uh, groups of Mapuches. Some of them are perfectly peaceful, and other ones are, has, uh, are fighting for what they think they are their uh, rights. And uh, we are working with that. We are dealing with that. Uh, we are trying to give them some land that, that they belong to their ancestors, but uh, this has problems. We are already let him teach uh, their own language. They don't write. They only speak uh, in, in their own language. And we are trying to improve that. Uh, we have some problems there, but uh, they are not big ones, to tell you the truth. Uh, maybe some noisy areas, but not, not real danger for nothing. And I think that the democracy that we are enjoying now and the freedom we have to express ourselves, and that's very important. What we need yet, and with this I finish, it's that uh, we need freedom to get uh, we which uh, according to our limits. 
that we must work yet. If, if you are a wise, powerful young man, you must be the possibilities to go wherever you, you might be. And this, we must do it a lot uh, yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, do you wish to Just, make uh, any comment? I'll be very brief. Um, I think um, there's, there's been some excellent comments and questions from the audience and, and my and colleagues. And there were more, but we couldn't yes, take them. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and our colleagues have, have answered them uh, 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 very, very well. Um, I'll, I'll speak not on a specific situation, but just generally, I, I think one of the comments was uh, about military coups and, and the role of the military. And, um, you know, it's not the case in every situation, but I think virtually all. Uh, why do coups happen? Uh, there's always usually some level of popular support for them. Could be minor, could be major. Um, it's because the institutions of the state do not function. Um, and I, I think that's critical. It's not only the political institutions, the judicial institutions, but the economic institutions, if you will. Um, and that's why I think the point the ambassador mentioned before, the the growing problem of income disparity, uh, youth unemployment in many countries is, is very relevant. Um, and institutions have to <clears throat> work, they have to function, they have to be seen to be functioning. Um, so the importance of transparency, the importance of dialogue, the importance of respect among political parties, among judicial bodies, uh, and, and so forth, um, are, are critical. And the last point, um, is, is the question of history, which I think has come up several times. And I think there, I don't think there's any country in the world um, that can look back on its history and say, wow, we were perfect. We didn't do anything wrong. We've done everything right over the course of our, our history. Canada is no different. In, in our particular case, it's not so much conflict, although we, we did do some things during the First and Second World War to inter people just based on their ethnicity or nationality. Um, but we have a challenge, as the uh, Ambassador of Chile mentioned, with indigenous people. Um, and um, we have not uh, treated them very well in the past. Uh, we're trying to make uh, strong efforts to repair that. And one of the things is to restore or build a proper historical record. So we have a truth and reconciliation on something that was done where uh, the children of indigenous people were put in, uh, uh, taken away from their parents and put in institutions. So, it's, it's not so much because we want to cover up the past, we want a, a clear historical uh, record that we can then build on so that all Canadians, including uh, Indigenous people, can participate fully in the state. Thank you very much. Mr. Madison, do you wish to yeah. make any comments? Perhaps very briefly, because uh, again, they are very timely comments and, and, and good questions. Um, and first of all, I, I'd just like to underline that from my first intervention, Talking won't solve everything, so it's it's uh, it's a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition in in my view. Uh, on Turkey, uh, I've been here for three years now, uh, and I uh, I understand uh, how little I understand, uh, better and better. But I have made some observations in the past three years, and that is that new issues come to the agenda in new ways. Uh, when the president opened Parliament last autumn, he, his main point was to say that Turkey has a constitution that was constructed to protect the state against the citizens, and you, parliamentarians, your most important task before you is to reverse this. You must come together and create a constitution that protects the, uh, the citizens against the state. This is, these are big issues, uh, and, and, and I think we should also recognize that they are being faced in, in, in Turkey today, and that this is, uh, is not really. Similarly, on, on uh, what you could call the Armenian issue, uh, it was a very interesting autumn in 2009, my, my first autumn here, where Turkey showed a clear interest uh, in engaging the issue. Uh, and the relationship between Armenia and Turkey today, in my view, and a personal one at that, uh, is that this is not so much about Armenia and Turkey anymore, as it is about say, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, diasporas, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and also on the Kurdish issue, uh, last summer, you know, uh, Turkish newspapers started writing about talks between the state and PKK, apparently in Oslo. And I got quite a few questions about that as a Norwegian diplomat. I could 
you know, truthfully answer that I don't know. Uh, but what struck me was that the disclosure of the state talking to PKK was not seen as controversial. It did not stir a debate in Turkey. Uh, and Aslan pointed to all the difficulties talking to PKK because they continue to commit terrorist attacks uh, and ma make them a very, that makes them a very difficult partner. But it wasn't seen in Turkey as controversial to actually engage in that form of dialogue. No, there has been other issues later uh, uh, on the uh, Mr. Fedan, the chief of intelligence. I think that is a which has stirred more controversy, but that is, I think, also partly a, a different discussion. Uh, but sitting down and engaging difficult issues, the most difficult issues, and uh, is something that is a part of the Turkey that I have learned to know over the past years. So thank you. Thank you very much. You are lucky that you started to understand Turkey better. <laughs> Because wherever I was posted, I, uh, in the first week, after one week of stay in that country, among several countries that I served, uh, I could say a lot of things. But the more I lived in that country, the more I understood it less. Yeah, that, so you that, are, that, that was, you are my, point, that, that was my, my point exactly. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yes. Three years in, I understand. Thank less you less. for all <laughs> panelists. Now I turn to uh, perhaps uh, Mark whether he has any administrative announcement to make. Well, before any administrative announcements, I'd ask everyone to please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to Mr. Yakesh and the entire panel for an excellent panel discussion. Thank you very much.